So I'm here to talk about a little story. I'm here to talk about the initiative. So uh, just a quick background, we run a maker space in India called Makers Asylum, which started out back in 2013 out of a small little garage to set up uh, one of India's first uh, community maker spaces. And over the years, uh, uh, it really began as a space where people used to come together and we used to build stuff. It started in a small garage where about 30 of us used to have the key to it and we would go use the space, prototype our ideas and build things. But what started happening is a lot of people started to come to us to all and, uh, try and uh, use these new tools like 3D printers, etc. So we started working on different, different programs, various learning programs. Like uh, we have this program called SDG School, where universities also started sending their students for a credit to learn about hands-on learning and making. And by the way, all the projects coming out of them apply for the Oshawa certification. So that's also really, really beautiful. And over the years, many, many projects have been coming together that have all been applying for the, uh, that have been uh, getting the Oshawa certification and open sourcing their projects and building this community over here. And then following came 2020, the pandemic, and that's the I will email. So I will go ahead and try and share my screen. Okay, I think my screen share is working. So a little story about the pandemic. This is of our past spaces that I was talking about. On the top left, the garage. On the bottom right is our current space here in Goa. And by now, uh, moving forward, sorry about this. Yes, there we go. So when the pandemic came, uh, pretty much shut everything for us just like any, every other part of the world. But however, being in space, it was also quite scary and at the same time, uh, continue to do what we love doing at Maker's Asylum. So all of us decided that we're gonna quarantine at Maker's Asylum instead of going back home. So we did initially there were about three of us and slowly that number started growing. During this time, huge initial shortage PPE uh, in India, like many, many parts of it. Uh, and uh, we did not know this at that time, but we were learning about how big the issue is. So we started a small initiative in India, 10,000 patients. Laser cutting, we built different hospitals, start with various hospitals and doctors and asked them for the feedback and were able to quickly come up with a design that worked. And we said, okay, now let's make 10,000 of them. 10,000 was a huge number thinking of time when all this was shut. So that means that finding material was a big issue. Going, moving places was a big issue. Manpower was an issue. We were just part of the lab, remember? Volunteers started flocking and we had over 20 people inside our lab, living there, making face shields, putting them at the same time. We went through over 21 design iterations and uh, we saw an aha moment when uh, big Anul came up to make them using foam board, which was uh, revolutionary because board as will every stationary shore across the country. When I was talking about the supply chain, so in India, all the trains and the flights and everything were shut. So the only thing we could use to move these facials from the lab to the other places were ambulances or police cars. But that was also very, very limited. So how do you move more in a pandemic? And that's when the thought of open source once again prevailed. We open sourced the design, started making videos, sharing them with every part of the country to start making them using local materials for their local uh, hospitals and we started joining the dots. So we started connecting hospitals, foundations to local maker spaces, and then sharing the designs and everything they needed to be able to make those locally for their use case. And very, very soon, over 42 cities, towns, and villages joined the force. And uh, every 
one from BBC News to all the Indian news channels started talking about this initiative. And pretty much in every part of India now, we had a lab that was active. And we ended up making over 1 million face shields in a matter of 49 days. Now, just to put that into perspective, 1 million in the time of the pandemic, from the first day of the lockdown, it took us 100, uh, 15 days to make the first 100,000 face shields. But then things changed pretty quickly. We were able to make the next 100,000 face shields within seven days. And then eventually, as you can see, we were making 100,000 face shields a day. And the way this was happening is that over here, you can see the graph where the yellow line is Maker's Asylum, which was consistent and just keeping holding the fort. But more labs were joining the force, and some of them were even faster than us. Some of them were uh, using different technologies, and that really helped to increase the collective intelligence of this group. So we were not only just sharing, but we were also learning from the other labs, and together we were making them faster. And I think that's the true power of open source and distributed manufacturing at work. And very soon, everyone from the police personnel to the doctors across the country were all wearing our face shields. It was a completely interdisciplinary group, anywhere from chefs to doctors to musicians to filmmakers to uh, engineers were all part of the collective. The youngest member of the M19 initiative was only 12 years old and he made over 344 face shields with his family in Gujarat. This went on to become a very exciting case study on frugal innovation by the University of Cambridge and uh, of course, OSMS. And we did a lot of different use cases of these face shields. We went on to make superhero face shields for teenagers. We made baby face shields for newborns. We made active respirators with the open source community along with Ames Hospital in Delhi. We made rebreather masks for senior citizens so they could breathe easily during uh, while wearing the mask. But while all of this was happening in India, open source medical su supplies did a survey and a study and 48.3 million units of medical devices, uh, supplies were created by the maker cult movement across the world. So while we were thinking about this in India, every other maker community was thinking in a similar manner. And that was what was so beautiful about this open source and collective uh, distributed uh, network of labs and maker spaces. However, there was a problem. There was a problem of quality assurance and quality checks. And a lot of labs and a lot of maker spaces were not able to make the same quality as one or the other. And that still exists in distributed manufacturing. And while we were answering that question came wave two. Wave two was very crazy in India. During the second wave in India, we uh, had a huge oxygen crisis. And that's when we looked at oxygen concentrators, uh, thanks to, again, the open source global community. We studied all the existing designs from the Marut design to the Apollo design and learned a lot about them. But however, we realized that none of them were manufacturing ready or certified. So we started, we immediately got to work once again in Goa at Maker's Asylum and started building them under the leadership of Anul. And very quickly, we were able to not only just prototype uh, multiple versions of the oxygen concentrator, but we were able to solve a lot of the issues that were coming with oxygen concentrators in India, especially related to humidity, related to power cuts, related to electronics. And we were able to create the M1902, which you can see on the rightmost part of the screen. This is now also certified. While building this, one of the key focus that we were trying to address as part of this was how do you scale this in a distributed open manner? And over 30 organizations were able to take this and also go into production with these designs. This was also so a big shout out and big thanks to uh, once again, the Cambridge University that has this center of distributed manufacturing that really helped us do the study around how do you scale an open source device or any device rather in a distributed manner, but at the same time, uh, maintaining quality checks and quality assurances. And we're still building on this, trying to create a very 
exciting, simple framework for more people to use this and to be able to scale their ideas. Uh, that's the M1902 once again. Uh, one more thing that happened during the M19 initiative or while we were building these oxygen concentrators was that uh, approximately 300,000 concentrators were also imported to India. But once again, a lot of them started breaking. And this is something that is very common. A lot of medical devices, when they're imported from a different part of the world to a different part of the world, they necessarily don't work so smoothly. And uh, that's when a lot of doctors started reaching out to us to try and help fix them. So we once again use the same exact network of the M19 Collective, this decentralized network that was working on the open source oxygen concentrators to host repair camps and, uh, and try and fix the ones that were broken. Very quickly, within just two camps, we were able to service about 30 oxygen concentrators. And that's 30 less gone into the landfill, right? So that was what was beautiful about it. Uh, currently, we're still doing more research around creating this decentralized network of not just building uh, devices, but also repairing and reusing them uh, while we continue to teach and learn through our program at Maker's Asylum and uh, encourage all our students to also build and share uh, via the open source ecosystems. Thank you very much. That's about it from my side. I'm happy to take questions if we have the time. Thank you so much, Vipop. That's amazing. Um, we thought 10,000 was a lot, but apparently 10,000 is uh, not a lot. <laughs> um, incredible, incredible scaling. Um, so a question for you. Um, how did makerspaces get cooperation with local authorities for resources such as ambulances or trans for transit? So what happened over here with us in uh, Mumbai was uh, when we were in Mumbai, uh, very quickly people started to notice the work that we were doing and uh, we were able to get in touch with uh, uh, the ministry and also the police. So once we got the permission, we were able to share that further with uh, the other maker spaces as well and send them a letter which sort of helped get them the basic support that you know these guys are working with this foundation uh, they already have uh, support of the Mumbai uh, uh, police so please uh, share the same to them and sort of escalated and really got the community rolling at that time amazing yeah so it seems like you really uh had a snowball effect going on there. Um, what's currently happening with uh, all of these efforts? So, like I said, currently what we're trying to do at the moment is uh, look at the re repair and reuse side of things. Uh, so while the, uh, and also actually, the second thing that we're trying to look at is uh, the power, because as you just saw what happened to me over here, we lost power in India and uh, I was not able to join the call on time. Similarly, there are a lot of power cuts that happen over here in different, different parts of the country, apart from the major cities. So one of the things that we're trying to address with the uh, M1902 as part of the collective is uh, on alternative power sources for the oxygen concentrators. That's one. The other thing we're doing is the uh, use ecosystem that how we can actually fuel that and continue to share that knowledge so that people can repair and reuse uh, in a sustainable manner across the country. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, repair and uh, reuse is such an important part of all of this. Um, another question for you. Is there, can you like talk about what you think the limits are for community manufacturing? You know, are there limits? Um, and if so, what are the bottom and top bounds for the, those limits? One of the one of the things that we realized, which we're still trying to uh, build upon, is the quality assurance and quality check parts that I talked about. That definitely is a limiting factor because what happens is that let's say if uh, Makers Asylum in Mumbai got certification for the oxygen concentrator, that same thing does not follow to all the other labs. The certification does not follow. However, we can maintain certain uh, uh, checks on our own to be able to make sure that they all get the certification as well. But there is that limit that makes it 
it so that you need to be able to create in a certain amount to be able to validate or uh, make sure it's worth it as well uh, at the end of the day. So that's one I would say. Uh, on the other side, I would uh, think that the different kinds of materials that are available in different cities also creates a little bit of uh, 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 what do you call it? fluctuation in the way that things work. However, uh, that can be solved through creation of a platform that allows us to use similar uh, materials to be able to apply for the same certification. And that's what we're trying to do right now. Oh, cool. Interesting. Um, I think that it relates to maybe a follow up question, which is about quality control uh, for distributed manufacturing. It seems like a, um, a big part of it is like the big differences that there are with quality control when you have so many different community members participating. Um, and so do you have like maybe some really insightful takeaways you can share? Um, like how do you communicate quality control to all of these different people in the community? Um, what are ways in which you like can, can draw them together? This, uh, you know, talk to us about this extremely exciting topic, quality control. Quality control. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely a very exciting topic. So uh, what happened during the face shield part was that when we were building them, obviously uh, this was like an extreme crisis situation. And the point was to be able to make as many as possible, super fast, but also remember quality. Uh, during this time, what we were doing to communicate was like day and night calls, trying to make sure that everyone's on the same page, but that doesn't work really well. So what we're trying to do now and what the University of Cambridge is trying to help us out with is building a simple app that requires uh, each of the labs to take photographs through the different processes to be able to check that. Similar to actually what happens with a lot of uh, uh, apps, for example, uh, like for example, uh, there is Urban Clap in India, which I know, I don't know uh, the different names of ones outside, which requires like a certain quality checks to be maintained using photographs. Photograph and upload and say that yes, this matches the certain check. If not, if you use something else, then you have to basically call uh, or uh, reach out to one of the validating labs or hubs to say that I've made this change, what do I need to change? So again, using GitHub, using other ways to be able to talk back and ask uh, uh, the different labs to be able to say that, yes, I've made these changes. Is this okay? So I can proceed. Or Oh, cool. So it's kind of like a way in which you can create a platform um, for everyone to communicate with each other and kind of evolve what, this, what the expectations are, taking photos as a way to communicate along the way. That's awesome. So for- That's one thought, but yeah. like you know, there is no, not always one proper thought. It's oh, an evolving shucks. I thought community. everybody that was speaking at the Open Source Hardware Summit was gonna have solved everything that we had in the world, all these problems. <laughs> We're all learning as we go along. That's the beautiful part about this community, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, so how did you get other people involved in the community? So as you grew, how did people find out about you? Like, what were ways in which you did community organizing and, and engage people? Okay, so this is slightly embarrassing, but we used to make uh, daily update videos and we used to bank tables and make really fun daily update videos that were talking about what is the number for the day, how many video, how many, how many facials did we make today, what are the other labs that joined the force, what uh, exactly happened. At that time, it was really effective. It was, it was uh, bringing more and more people every day. Literally, initially, one one lab was joining. Eventually, there were 10 to 15 labs a day joining. So it, it oh, was wow. like a snowballing effect like you talk about. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, those videos really helped because it in helped invite other people into the community. And they also felt like they were part of this. And uh, just as a single lab, like our numbers, maybe were like in the beginning, one or 2,000 uh, face shields a day. But when you joined all the numbers together, then it started sounding really big because we were going from not just making a few thousand face shields that make us a salon, but as a collective, we were making almost like, like I said, towards the end, a hundred thousand face shields a day. So yeah, exponential scaling allows surprises every time. 
<laughs> right. So that really helped like create momentum in the in the in sort of the labs joining and wanting to be a part of it. That's incredible. Well, this has been an incredible project. There's lots of people who have questions for you, um, especially if like you can share your link slide, maybe in the Discord channel, um, the community-led distributed manufacturing Discord channel to continue the talk. Next